<laughs> okay, I guess we're good. Right, um, sure. So, yeah, man, you were talking about Northfield. What are – you pretty much just said it. You just want to have them show you what they can show you, what they got pretty much, what their movement capability looks like. Yeah. How do you approach it that way? What, why do you not try to teach them, hey, you have to hit this certain position or you have to move like this? Is that like a time thing because it was only 30 minutes or is that true learning? Um, it's yes and no because the, the main thing I do when I like first approach a team is like I want to create buy-in and I want to first create like trust and relationship. Um, cause if I go in and say, all right, guys, this is the way this is it. Don't ask me questions. Like I'm yeah. coming in for their authoritative figure. And like, I'm like barely five, nine, barely one fifty wet. Like, I'm not going to walk up to a group of teams and like, I'm normally smaller than everyone. Like my main goal with a lot of people is like, yo, like, let me, let me just show you that I know what I'm talking about and that I genuinely care about you. Right. Um, and so like, that's when I we'll approach these teams and with like fun reactionary drills um, to also kind of just see, especially when it comes to reactionary, it's much more lively and that's their true like movement patterns. Um, a lot of the time when we'll go into a session and I'm kind of like talking about certain things to focus on, they'll start kind of changing how they're running, um, changing their mindsets or point of focus, whatever it is. Um, and so when I go through something like uh, my push up start series that I got from working at the Sport and Speed Institute, that's like my just go to drill. Um, I can just run it just subconsciously. I can adapt it kind of in that moment. Um, but it also just really allows me just to watch them, how they get going, what do they do with their arms, you know, where are their eyes when they're running. Um, so it's just a really easy way to kind of just like get the assessment without actually going in and putting hands on them trying yeah. to get videotapes of them and especially like you kind of said like i only got 30 minutes yeah so i'm gonna get the highest priority stuff that i can and then work from down that and it's um, a team you got team. you know a bunch yeah. of a bunch of boys in 30 minutes and so and you're kind of using it as like a an assessment tool you're watching yeah. what they're giving you yeah so i just i just want to see how they naturally move i just want to see how they interact i want to see how they compete you know like what kind of stress do they get when you put them in an uncomfortable environment? Are they breakers? Are they bloomers? You know, do they mm. bend? You know, so. Um, What's a breaker and bloomer? So uh, I get those terms from Hank Kreinhoff. Um, and he describes it kind of as like a stress and how these athletes respond to stress. And so he says a bender um, is like 60, 70% of the population. And that's somebody that's like, does more or less of kind of what you're asking. Okay. Um, and a lot of these contexts, I think of like from uh, sprinters uh, competing at like Olympic level, world level, ch like championships. That's like the true, true stressors on the athletes uh, mentally and physically. Um, at that level, so that's what you're saying? Yeah. So okay. you can see it in the high school, but like, like a state playoff game compared to like Olympic qualifying, like uh, can't even compare them on the same level. Yeah. Um, but when you kind of can classify these athletes into how they respond to stress, so the bender is kind of like more or less what they're looking for. The bloomer is the one that's a lot more rare. And you're kind of looking at like, these guys thrive under stress. Yeah. They just sell at the most stressful events, the most stressful competitions, and that's where they get their PRs. Um, and then you have the breakers, the kids that, you know, do phenomenal in training, phenomenal in the weight room, but you, you put them in a stressful environment, a competition, they just, they, yeah. they breaks loose. They poop out. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, like you could literally work on something like block starts, you know, and if they're like a breaker, you know, they just fall start. They just get in their head yeah. and just like get antsy and just go. Yeah. So um, do you train them differently or, or talk to them differently. How do you approach that? <clears throat> so this is where it's kind of just comes down to like, really um you know there's a lot of things and it's it's um it really comes down to in my opinion like their confidence level so how many times have you worked on that in preparation pre prepared for that in order to get them there and you know if it's like say like we'll just keep using block starts as like the example that they keep just shooting the gun you know you gotta like all right guys like in the next session you're gonna go when you're ready you know, we're just going to kind of see it and says that. Does it take you too long to get ready? 
Does it take, are you getting yeah. ready too quickly? Um, there's an optimal amount of time that I want them to take from the set, get in the blocks to, or the ready, get in the blocks, set, come up and then go. Um, you know, if you rush those or delay it, everything, the timing starts coming off. Um, so when you can look at repetition and stuff like that, like if it's like a breaker, you want to do it in the most least stressful environment. So you don't want them competing with anyone next to them. Probably best to have a one-on-one -on -one situation or, or a session um, and just really give them in a sense the confidence to say, hey, man, that looked really good. Hey, like this is, you know, reinforcing what looks good. Don't even talk about what looks bad. Um, and then ideally we can look at kind of stressing their their systems a little bit more with like then all right you're going off my call okay mm -hmm. you're going off like the block start whatever it is um and then i would want to add somebody next to them because usually once you get somebody next to them the competitive level starts coming up right and mental strategies and prep steps we take to get ready starts kind of um well that's where we start losing that focus so um but yeah if they're like a like a breaker the confidence level is 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 huge for them if they're a bloomer if they're somebody that just thrives in stressful environments i'm going to make that the most uncomfortable stressful stress session for them possible get people next to them have them go on certain uh repetitions have a lot of reactionary drills um but make it a lot more of a competing setting versus just like technique setting okay technique would be better for for the breakers uh or yep. what's the other one? It's breaker, bloomer, and then what? Benders? Uh, bender. Yeah. What, so that would be good for bender kind of mixture. You can I have think a little of, bit more I leeway. Think, I think they have a little bit more of a leeway. Um, and this is kind of, again, comes down to the individual athlete. Um, you can have some kind of more on the spectrum of like, you know, they do a little bit more of what you're expecting, but you don't expect them to just blow out of the water. Right. Um, those are people that would probably thrive in both situations and probably a combination of both. Um, but for the most part, if they're a bender, I'm going to try to push them. I'm going to try to push their stress levels to the point of where we're breaking. And then we'll just kind of sit under that level. And if we can kind of push that bar over the season, then perfect. That's kind of like the 1% uh, improvements that we're looking for. Right. Yeah. Little increment levels of improvement. Now with that kind of what you were, what, what I was thinking about when you were saying that, are you able to change people from one, from a breaker to a bender, to a bender, to a bloomer? Or is that like a little bit of progressive overload, if you will, like, hey, he's able to handle this much more stress. Now he acts more like a bender rather than a breaker because we built him up to that. Yeah, I would definitely argue that somebody could start in one and go into another. And then I'd also argue that one could go in the opposite direction as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this could most likely be from stressful environments that could be outside of their sport. Um, you know, maybe they have a significant other or somebody close to them that's passed away that completely changes the mindset that, you know, that could be a huge, huge step back. Um, I would argue that that would be pretty rare and i would you'd probably see a lot of these like benders move into just more flexible benders mm -hmm. but i think the people that are blossomers are the people that one will consistently compete at a very high level um but i don't really see them kind of getting out of that in the sense of like if they're very adapt to that very high stressful environment and can respond and compete and perform in that environment i don't see them moving a lot away from that mm -hmm. um, but i would definitely argue that a bender could become more rigid and and potentially become into a bloomer um but i don't know if that would be a super big change because i i think it's mostly mental um but i think it would mostly come down to like the confidence with a lot of the athletes um I mean, like working with youth athletes, like confidence is, is, is probably one of the bigger things. Um, and once you just get their confidence and just kind of reassure that, like, you know, this is okay. Everything's fine. Like, you know, you lose, you lose, we go back to the drawing board. Like it's kind of whatever. Um, I think also too, with like the amount of stress you can put on them, the wording, you know, the timing, how you kind of approach like each say competition you could just reassure that's like, Hey man, everything's okay. Like you're good. Don't worry. Like you had an off game. So what? We still won. We're fine. 
So um, I would definitely say people could move, but I, I would also argue that I think a lot of people would be very kind of in their lane, in their zone. Yeah. Are you looking at body language, what they're saying, and, and also how they're responding to uh, what you give them? Kind of like you said, if you give them a drill and they jump the gun or just completely do the drill completely wrong when they're with someone else versus on their own, are you just kind of looking at every single thing yeah so and this is where i kind of want to like because one thing that uh coach cab talks about is like you know like developing your coaching eye um and i think there's a lot of means of developing and a lot of things to look for um and i think this is actually something you talked about as well but like watching an athlete walk into your weight room like watch an athlete get out of the car like you said like what shoes are they wearing and we can pick up all this stuff and you're like how do they stand how close are their feet together you know the more like the less space they take up they're probably pretty nervous they're probably not super confident with themselves if you assume somebody with this like nice big barrel chest they got a nice little like, kind of like swag walk with them like they got a lot of confidence and you can right. approach that athlete very differently um you usually kind of see i mean and this is where like a lot of the athletes and like consistently working with them like you really figure them out over time by just watching what they're doing when you're not requiring them to do something you know like when you require them to go get water like do they quickly walk over grab water and then walk back and start waiting for the next thing or do they make their way over hang out maybe do they grab their phone like things like that it can all show kind of how checked in they are into this session um so i train like i train uh these two brothers and um one of them's older much taller plays at a very high level the younger brother um mentally he's just not a, not as mature as i'd like him to be but he can still play at a very high level moves very well um but you can tell a huge huge difference in their confidence and how they approach this session and how they are in the session just because of where they're at mentally um the older brother is very mature and he's very dedicated and so he wants to work so he'll literally run over grab water and he'll be back on that line like what's next what do we do yeah. um the other brother kind of scrolls in starts laughing some of the little drills who like do like the t-rex arm which is like it's like you know it's like i'm glad he's having fun <laughs> but <laughs> the second you start taking away from the session for your brother i'm gonna literally i'm gonna i'm just gonna say something and mm -hmm. i've had to talk with him a few times and like I'm the younger brother. I get it. But when I was in a situation to compete with my little, with my older brother, like I wanted nothing to be like, I only wanted to be better than him. Um, so the confidence is huge and how these athletes will stand in a session and a walk in a session, like what they do when I'm not telling them something to do is, is all these indicators. Um, if an athlete comes up to me and asks a question, like something else that they could do, like, Hey, what's something I can do to work on this? it's it's insane it's phenomenal um it's it's you know it's really encouraging when athletes do that because then it's like oh you you're not just assuming that you just do this one hour and, and things around you just start getting better like you have an understanding that i need to put some work in for this in order for me to get something out yeah they want to <clears throat> so, they know what they want from you and they they also realize that hey it's going to require more than a one hour thing a week and they also yeah. trust you it's kind of like that that buy-in is that what you would say it's they almost buy in so much that they know they need <laughs> they know they need more rather than just oh, i'm just here to show yeah up. yeah and on the other spectrum of that you know if an athlete comes in and i'm like hey man like i need you to do these three stretches all right i'll give you the time frame this is how you do it all that all right send them off <laughs> and they come back and they ask hey coach like what's next what else can i do all right, well, did you do those three stretches? Well, I did like one out of the three. Okay, well, no, sorry, you haven't gained my trust for me to give you the next step, to give you that information. Sure. Therefore, we're at a standstill until you do one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. um, and that also shows huge onto the athletes that they want to get there as quick as possible. They don't really, you know, trust the process. They're not patient. Um, you know, and so how they're asking these questions, when, this and that, like it's all good things to indicate, to look for. Um, and to take into account like where they're at mentally. Yeah, and seeing seeing what they're buying in the process is. Yeah, like are they looking at other coaches on Instagram, YouTube, and saying, "Hey, coach, <laughs> why are we doing this? well, because yeah. that's 
fucking stupid. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to do a backflip on a BOSU ball wide, uh, shoot tennis balls at you out of a tennis ball machine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I was talking to uh, another coach and, and you know him, but I'm not going to name drop it. Um, but uh, he was kind of talking about like, in a sense, um, it was weird because it was like it was like two phases, like one phase or one point of focus was like power for strength. And the other one was like stability and balance. And you're trying to like. And he was like trying to train those both in like one exercise. And it's like you realize when the body is knows when it's not stable, it's not going to produce the same amount of force. So if you're doing these training protocols that like don't even like they literally fight each other, like you're not. I know it's going to happen. I'm not going to say you're not going to get to your results, but like, I, I really, I have no idea. Um, so yeah, when, when athletes like ask questions like that, like, Hey coach, what do you think of this? Like, it's hilarious topics. It's hilarious to be like, well, well first, before I answer, what do you think of this? Right. You know, like, what are you seeing? Like, what, what, do you, what goes through your head first when you see this, mm-hmm. you know, if they're like, Oh, I think it looks pretty good. You might need to do like more, educating on you know what is strength training why are we doing every exercise you know why are we progressing to this and not this blah blah right kind of laying the foundation and and the brick road saying hey i can get you to point b this is the road that that we want to take together and i feel is best and here's why rather than uh you know we're gonna shoot a cannon over here and skip all this but we're gonna get you to point b it's yeah. may not be the same. You may not land there safely uh, if you just yeah. try to skip the road. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to get there. I don't know what it's going to hit when it gets there. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but uh, this kind of goes into the, to the program design that I've been really diving into with, uh, with coach Ian Kink. Um, he's a, uh, it's crazy to listen to his history and to kind of how he's developed a lot of these ideas and everything, but, a lot of his stuff came up through just working with professional athletes, like thousands of athletes at extremely high levels and being like, you know what, this three by 10 method doesn't work at all. You know, it works to an extent, but you know, like strength is easy, you know, it's falling out of a boat and hitting water. Um, But when like, when we look at the like Ian King program design style, his step process, it's a 35 step process to write his programs to write programs for his athletes and it's just the level of detail that he gets into and the level of planning and programming that he gets to that i'm just like dude that's that's what i want like that's all in um so but i i I, i'm telling you man like i'm picking the finger to scratch the surface with like that's where i'm at what's Um, one of the biggest things that you've uh seen and, and learn from looking at his thing, uh, looking at his programming. And then also, uh, if you've applied it, what, what have you seen it be done in your business or in your training? Yeah. Um, I haven't applied it yet just because like, I, I don't have a gym right now. And like, I, I haven't been working with, um, athletes in strength training. I've pretty much only been doing speed training. Um, but the biggest thing I've noticed is really just the level of detail. That like, if you want to work with these athletes, you want to work with these high level athletes and you're not providing a level of detail to this extent, like you're just not doing them the service that they deserve. Mm-hmm. Um, and like <clears throat> when I approach kind of like the level I want to get to, like there's no like ceiling, there's no, there's no end level. There's no like end goal of, you know, how high or how good I want to be, but it's really just the ability to service the athletes that come to me. And if I don't touch a professional athlete in my life, I'm cool with that. Um, But it's just really comes down to just like, if an athlete is coming to me and they're paying this much money and I'm requiring this much money, then I'm going to go balls to the wall to provide Mm -hmm. a service that I believe is to the best of my knowledge. Right. You know, and if you provide something that's second string, third string, then like don't provide it at all, in my opinion. Right. Um, so when I look at this level of detail that Ian King has, like, that's just, you know, that's what I want to adopt. And down the road, I'll probably modify it to like my own extent and this and that. Um, but the dude has incredible results. 
phenomenal, phenomenal results. And if I can take his kind of work and say, you know, like, let me just see what you're doing. Let me learn what you're doing and see, you know, how your process is and then kind of modify it down the road for myself. Like, you know, it, it then becomes my own. Um, but the big thing is, you know, I want to credit who I'm getting these ideas from the knowledge from the methodologies from, um, so I'm going to try to like really keep kind of referencing to who I'm talking about. Sure. Um, Cause yeah, that's something that he like just shits on is like Americans stealing all of his, yeah. uh, <laughs> all of his work. Oh, uh, where, is, where is he from? So he's from Australia. Okay. And, uh, um, he, he's developed so many innovations, so many like methods of training, like really what is strength training that we have used that we just didn't even know where we got it from. So um, the three number tempo. Instagram. Sequ- we got it from Instagram. Yeah. So like half the, like <laughs> so much of the stuff that we, that we see on Instagram, we get from like these random people. And she's like, we don't even know where these concepts are coming from. Um, and so when I was working at the elite, I was like building this, this list of books. that was like all old school coaches. That was like probably 90% from the Soviet union. Mm-hmm. Of just like, what are these methodologies? What are these periodization plans? And, and where are we getting all this stuff from? And then as you know, it's kind of like a big game of telephone, you know, like you say, the blue bird has been sitting on the green paddy way, eating the watermelon, you get to the end of the thing and it's like the yellow elephant jumped over the fence it's like that like two completely different things and all it did was just travel from one person to the next so you could understand that like somebody's original idea original concept down the telephone line has become something that's honestly so far from what it originally was it's it's not it's not the same thing Hmm. um so how do you get closer to the original was that by you know, in a sense, being able to talk to those people through reading their books or through finding out what they're saying, you know, come from the the mouth that says it first. Yeah. Um, like I would, and it's unfortunate, but a lot of these, you know, authors have passed away by, by now. And, um, there's some that are, you know, they're, they're still trucking, but you know, they're late eighties, early nineties, if that, um, but it's kind of just like trying to like go through the timeline and be patient of, or just like do doing your due diligence of like, where did this information come from? Um, so the, like, there's so many, these little methods that came from, so like, uh, like a back off set, ever heard of that? Mm -mm. So back off set is kind of like doing, um, so they'll kind of do in King's reference, this like six, one, six, one slash like 1520 rep scheme. And it's like six heavy, one fast, six heavy, okay. one fast. And then you'll end and your back off set is like 15 to 20 reps of a lighter weight. But after doing heavier weights, it's, it's been shown that you can recruit a little bit more and you can get a little more out of lighter weights. So they'll do this like, heavy light heavy light heavy light and then they'll go light but higher reps and allows them to push much more volume than they normally would if they just started or kept that same weight okay Um, but a back off set came from from uh fred hatfield dr squat and um like i didn't i didn't know that but a back off set is extremely common in in a lot of bodybuilding methods and nobody quotes him for that Mm -hmm. you know so um, I think our, our ability to kind of just like quote and reference people is, is kind of just like showing respect to the people that have put in the work to get to that point and through experience and knowledge and stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, I'm not that smart. I know that for a fact, like I'm not going to come up with these crazy exercises and this and that. Like I know exercises that work because it's worked with thousands and hundreds of athletes before. But, you know, obviously it has to be done proper. So, you know, like Ian King has a bunch of these, uh, like his abdominal stuff that I sent you. Um, so his, uh, his abdominal stuff is like slow and controlled, isolated work. Um, and I see so many people on Instagram that are like, you don't need to do core work. You can just hit it in the compound movements and boom, there's your core exercise. And it's just like, well, like it's involved 
but it's not isolated. You know, you're not seeing where your weaknesses are through your range of motion. You know, if you go and do a slow, so Ian King has a, it calls it a slow up, slow down, five seconds, sit up five seconds down. You'll, you will absolutely find your weak point going through that slow range of motion, but the second speeds involved in those reps, you just skip your weak points. So go out and do, you know, 10 sit-ups with a five seconds up, five seconds down cadence. If you can get to 10, cool. But if you go and do 20, like you're not going to get the same impact. You're not going to get the same results or benefit or level of transfer. um, If you're not doing the intention of the drill correctly, you know, or what it was originally designed for. Yeah. So it's kind of like what you said earlier, where you're rushing uh, the buy-in. It's the same kind of thing, whether it's through a training program or whether it's through a sit-up. So you can rush yeah. and, uh, you know, if, if your goal is to increase your, your true core. So from hip to shoulder, and including the backside of us, mm-hmm. uh, you know, core activation or, or control. And you're, if that's your goal and you're just doing compound movements, it's going to evolve it, but it may not be the most optimal or the most transferable to true core control. Yeah. Um, so your same kind of thing, like you said, even if you're skipping the reps or rushing the reps, you're kind of rushing the process and not really getting the goals that you want out of it. Yeah. Like if, if we're going to, if say we're going to look at like a, a combine bench um, and we're trying to find where an athlete's like weakest levels are, we'll probably start them with like, yo man, go balls to the wall and let's just time it. Where do you stop? How long does it take for you to go boom, 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 boom. Once that kid stops, what time are we at? that's the time frame we want to look at training. You know, we, we would probably want to look at extending that if all possible. Okay, cool. Now we kind of look at the endurance of that rep, rep form. At one point, you know, is your hardest phase of your bench. So let's go three seconds down, three seconds up and just keep going until like, you know, if you hit 20 reps on that tempo with more than 10 pounds on each side of the bar, like you're going to find where you're weak. For me, like I had, I have horrible shoulder strength. So it's like, I just was so bad at the bottom. Like once I get to that max stretch and everything. So I would do a lot of partial reps, like pauses there, quarter reps, and just get that extra range of motion and just really stress that one phase. But, you know, you don't find it out by just going balls to the wall, racketing, getting up, doing three sets of 10. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can kind of like test that, you know, that's just, one way that I might do it with one athlete, but you know, there's multiple ways of testing it. Like you do a push-up test. So um, yeah, the patience. (laughs) Yeah. Patience and slowing things down to speed things up. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty crazy, but um, yeah, I don't even really like lifting. So (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we spent a lot of this time talking about lifting your and you're doing speed. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna stop the recording. I think that's good on that.